So hello everyone and welcome back to some more Morrowind here on Twitch streams and later on in YouTube as well. And yes, it has to be flexible. Yes. So let's just go on and load back in. So we got all the Telvanni mages convinced that we should be Horthator, that are the normal ones that you should convince. But there are the ones that are added as part of the Telvani house stuff that I had in, plus overall just having this other full restored area of land after all. I always forget, forget exactly what the name of the place is or the mod's name, but you know. The added area, regardless. But yeah, so we are here. Not in our own place yet. Uh, I was thinking that I don't want to be looking like that, to be honest. Hey, I guess I could be taking some of these now too, considering we killed this person from here and uh, it's not like anyone else needs it. After all, well, of course I'm kind of carrying a little bit too much, aren't I? Dedrick Dagger. It's a pretty looking dagger, of course. Hmm. I can't really carry a lot. Which is the problem. I'm like thinking, hmm, how could I do this? I guess I could be just getting some of these things into our own place, apartment and so on and forth just quickly. So just do something like, uh, pick this up from here, uh, get into here, take the books I want, this back for us. And, uh, well, I don't think I have the magic to exactly travel immediately, but guess I'll just take that anyways. The final lesson, probably something that I already read, but I can take it if I'm gonna be taking some extra stuff. Don't need the other stuff from here for sure though. So I doubt I have enough magic for recall, but I can always try. Yeah, so basically I would need some sort of a way to restore my magic. That's of course very good to restore magics. I would prefer to use something worse than that if I have anything that would be worse. I'm not sure if I do. Resist. <sighs> so many potions, so many potions. Hey, that's worse. That's a lot worse. I'm gonna use that. Sure is. Oh, and hello Tayunta, welcome to the stream for you too. Welcome, welcome. Hopefully you have had also a good week. Ah, I, my mysticism skill increased also and you should rest and meditate on what you've learned. We shall do that here in our own apartment for sure. And I can also just leave this dagger here because why not? Well, I wanted to be leaving it more there, but because it's like a weapon, like those other things. <sighs> it's a sweet looking dagger. Maybe I should be putting that into here. But anyway, it's also too many books. Um, well, let's have a look. What all should I be leaving into here? At least we can have that book too. Maybe I should actually be reading that completely. I'm pretty sure I read that. Um... The frost wall uh, one, I'm sure, at the very least, we have in Tetrad. How did I have that again? I have so many of those Nasta Quata Quakis books at different times, for sure. Eh, sometimes so difficult to decide. I just leave this for a short moment so I can just come and put some of the books at least in here again. Uh, on top of our uh, tower of books, I'd say. Book of Towers, Tower of Books, because I'm not 100 sure if I have read them or not. Well, some at least I'm pretty sure I haven't. Necrom, doesn't sound familiar. Hmm, not sure about that. Dakotur message, Palla. At least I can put that into there. Then there's the couple at least that I'm not quite sure about that I'm pretty sure I haven't read. Hmm. 
Can I knife carry this? Yes. Let's just put a couple of more books into here that I'm pretty sure I have read, but I'm not 100% sure. Let's put that on top. It's pretty nice looking red cover after all. Like the art of magic I'm pretty sure I've read. Uh, the old ways probably read. That's actually a pretty nice looking book too. That I sure definitely have read, but I just need to sell it. In some place or another. Frostwall, probably red. Legends of the Dead, probably red. Was there something else I wanted to put in here? Not sure about this one. Morrowind Historia. Hmm. There. Some more books. Hello, Soten Tenho as well. Welcome to the stream for you too. How have you been this week? And yes, you should also be up for Sunday, so that's good. Um, I was thinking about 7 o'clock or something like that. We can test tomorrow or whatever. Yes, we got a book. Whatever time is good for you guys, we could be testing out the fact of um, actually seeing if we can make it work as in Borderlands 1 before Sunday. Entertainment for the bus. Got home from the meetup at Tuesday. Oh, you were um, somewhere future away even on the meetup. Well, I'm glad it was fun, Dayunta. Looking, not, <laughs> not for, looking forward to sitting in the bus for nine hours again. Okay, sounds good to me. Good. Um, so, are you back home or are you somewhere then elsewhere right now? If you are still waiting for the travel back with the bus. I'm not sure when that would then be. <laughs> well, it's good that the Pathfinder Kingmaker is then good if you've been occupied with it. Ah, visited Turku for the first time of my life. Okay, first time even. I did live for less than a year there, but it was a nice one year to live there nonetheless. Just, I prefer more northern areas. And 18 to 19 should be good. I think I might be streaming after testing thing. Okay, that's all A-OK. -okay. That works for me at the very least. Does that timetable work for Dayunta and Satentenho as well? We might just as well agree while we're here. <laughs> just hanging in Morrowind. I should sleep and uh, gain a level up and everything. So we are finally level 25. You have ascended to level 25. The results of hard work and dedication always look like luck to saps. But you know you've earned every ounce of your success. Intelligence, willpower. Um, what then, what then? Can't put more strength. Which is totally A-OK. -okay. Hmm. Maybe I should have some a slightly more personality. Just a sliver more personality. <sighs> well. We have a long way to increase in our skills more. Okay, destruction is relatively close. But then block always takes a long time to get up and restoration is not anywhere near high. Blunt weapons isn't high, enchantment definitely not. Alchemy is decently high in all reality, but medium armor 73 is still quite a ways to go. Axe we definitely aren't even training at the moment. So, yay. Well, maybe at some point. I'll be able to get into a good situation with all of those. I was thinking we could maybe read the four queens books now because we actually have all of the eight books now. Finally. Freaking finally. I probably should just put the last full queen book somewhere else than trying to put it on top of this freaking pile because it's so impossible to try to put it there in any decent manner. Did I completely screw myself over is also a good question, considering it started to flicker like that. Eh, or I just will be happy that it's there oh, somehow. Yes, definitely I won't be able to put it there better. Just you at least be somewhere over there, please. Uh, doesn't look very good, but oh well. Guess I can't do too much about that exactly. Uh. Okay. Works for me unless my terrible memory fails me. Don't let it fail you. 
and should work for Sara as well. Good. Um, <laughs> you have to tear yourself from the King Mayor, yes. I feel like my Baron is headed for disaster. Oh dear, that doesn't sound very promising. But yeah, before we go and head on trying to do other stuff again today, let's just let's just freaking get over these full queen books, which is like eight eight book series. So just hang back, listen to a story, and we'll see. And yeah, sorry to hear sorry that it's heading for disaster. Hopefully not. Hopefully not. Ah, Folk Queen Book 1. Let's start. So, The Wolf Queen Book 1 by Fognin Yard from the pen of the 1st century 3rd era Sage Mondokai, 3rd era 63. In the, in the autumn tide of the year, Prince Pelagius, son of Prince Uriel, who is son of the Empress Kintura, who is niece of the great emperor Tiber Septim, came to the high rock city-state of Camlorn to pay court to the daughter of King Fustet. Her name was Quintilla, the most beauteous princess in Tamriel, skilled at all the maidenly skills and an accomplished sorcerer. Eleven years, a widower with a young son named Antiochus. Belagius arrived at court to find that the city-state was being terrorized by a great demon, Werewolf. Instead of wooing, Pelagius and Quintilla together went out to save the kingdom. With his sword and her sorcery, the beast was slain and by the powers of mysticism, Quintilla chained the beast's soul to a gem. Pelagius had the gem made into a ring and married her. But it was said that the soul of the wolf stayed with the couple until the birth of their first child. Third Era Aikti the ambassador from Solitude has arrived, your majesty, whispered the steward Balvus. Right in the middle of dinner, muttered the emperor weakly. Tell him to wait. No, father, it's imp um. No, father, it's important that you see him, said Pelagius, rising. You can't make him wait and then give him bad news. It's undiplomatic. Don't go then, you're much better at diplomacy than I am. We should have all the family here, Emperor Uriel II added, suddenly aware how few people were present at his dinner table. Where's your mother? Sleeping with the Archpriest of Cunaret, Pelagius would have said, but he was, as his father said, diplomatic. Instead he said, at prayer. So, at prayer means this. So you know, guys know. And your brother and sister. Amiel is in the first hold meeting with the Archmagister of the Mage's Guild and Galana, though we won't be telling this to the ambassador, of course, is preparing for her wedding to the new Duke of Narcisse. Since the ambassador expects her to be marrying his patron, the King of Solitude instead will tell him that he is at the spa. Having a cluster of pestilent boils removed, tell him that he won't press too hard for the marriage. Politically expedient, though so it may be. Belakio smiled. You know how queasy Nords are about warty women. But that's it, I feel like I should have some family around so I don't look like some old fool despised by his nearest and dearest, growled the Emperor, correctly suspecting this to be the case. What about your five? Where's the she and the grandchildren? Quintilla's in the nursery with Sephorus and Magnus. Antiochus is probably purring around the city. I don't know where Potema is, probably at her studies. I thought you didn't like children around. Oh, hello, Specky. Welcome to the stream for you, too. We're having a long book stream, at least, or book reading for the moment. <laughs> yes, removal of pestilent boils indeed. But welcome, and hopefully you have had a good week thus far. I do during meetings with ambassadors in damp state rooms, sided the emperor. They lend an air of, oh, I don't know, innocence and civility. Ah, show the blasted ambassador in, he said to Balvus. Potoma was bored. It was the rainy season in the imperial province, province 
winter tide, and the streets and the gardens of the city were all flooded. She could not remember a time when it was not raining. Had it been only days, or had it been weeks or months since the sun shone? There was no judging of time any more in the constant flickering torchlight of the palace, and as Potema walked through marble and stone hallways listening to the plating of the rain, she could think nothing but sh that she was bored. As Steffi, her tutor, would be looking for her now, ordinarily, she did not mind studying. Road memorization came easily to her. She squeezed herself as she walked down through the empty ballroom. When did Orsinium fall? First era 918. Who wrote Tamriel's tractates? Gaucher. When was Typoseptin born? Second era 288. Who is the current king of Daggerfall? Mortune, son of Coltrune. Who is the current Sylvanar? Vaparent, son of Barbaril. Who is the warlord of Lilmot? Trick question. It's a lady. Yeah. <sighs> what will I get if I'm a good girl and don't get into any trouble and my tutor says I'm an excellent student? Mother and father will renege on their promise to buy me a theatre katana of my own, saying they never remembered that promise and it's far too expensive and dangerous for a girl of my age. There were voices coming from the Emperor's staterooms, her father, her grandfather, and a man with strange accent, Nord. Potema moved a stone she had loosened behind the tapestry and listened in. Let us be frank, your Imperial Majesty, came the Nord's voice. My sire, the King of Solitude, doesn't care if Princess Galana looked like an orc. He wants an alliance with the Imperial Valmili. And you agreed to give him Kalana, or give back the millions of gold he gave to you to quell the Kashiti rebellion in Torval. This was the agreement you swore to honor. I remember no such agreement, came her father's voice. I remember no such agreement. Can you, my leech? There was a mumbling noise that Potema took to be her grandfather, the ancient emperor. Perhaps we should take a walk to the Hall of Records. My mind may be going. The Nord's voice sounded sarcastic. It's so annoying when it's saying here the Nord is speaking when I'm already read this. Perhaps we should take a walk to the Hall of Records. My mind may be going, the Nord said. Voice sounded sarcastic. I distinctly remember your seal being placed on the agreement before it was locked away. Hello, thank you for the subscription again, Jim Jim. And welcome to stream for you too, Jim Jim. Good evening to you too. And uh, yeah, hopefully you have had a good week too. <sighs> I distinctly remember your seal being placed on the agreement before it was locked away. Of course, I may fairly be mistaken. We will send... Who is saying? We will send a page to the hall to get the document you refer to, replied her father's voice with the cruel soothing quality he used whenever he was about to break a promise. Potema knew it well. She replaced the loose stone and hurried out of the ballroom. She knew well how slowly the pages walked, used to run in rounds for a doddering emperor. She could make it to the call of records in no time at all. Thank you for the shears, Becky. And yes, everyone is here. <laughs> at least most of us, for sure we is. I don't know if Kone asked our scroll for this, but I would like if they were here too. <sighs> the massive ebony door was locked, of course, but she knew what to do. A year ago, she got her mother's Bosmer maid pilfering some jewelry. <laughs> Thank you, Jin Jin, then, on the other hand. Yes, all specs. And in exchange for her silence, forced the young woman to teach her how to be clocks. Hmm. Okay, so her mother's jewelry was stolen by a maid who she made to teach her to be clocks. Okay. Potema pulled two pins of her red diamond brooch and slid the first into the first lock, holding her hand steady and memorizing the patterns of tumblers and crews within the mechanism. Each lock had a geography of its own. 
the lock to the kitchen larder, six free tumblers, a frozen servant, and a counter bolt. She had broken into that just for fun, but if she had been a poisoner, the full imperial household would be dead by now, she thought, smiling. The lock to her brother Antiochus' secret stash of Kashiti pornography. Ah, just two free tumblers and a pathetic poison quill trap easily dismantled with pressure on the counterfeit. Ah, that had been a profitable score. It was strange that Antiochus, who seemed to have no shame, proved so easy to blackmail. She was, after all, only twelve, and the difference between the pervasions of a cat people and the pervasions of the Cyrandeal seemed pretty academic. Still, Antiochus had to give her the diamond brooch which she treasured. And yes, apparently so, seemed him, apparently so. And yes, Kitty's story circle. <laughs> Fireplace telling kids a story. Yes, definitely. Definitely like that, Smeki. She had never been caught. Not when she broke into the Archmage's study and stole his older spell book. Not when she broke into the quest room of the King of Kilana and stole his crown the morning before Magnus' official welcoming ceremony. It had become too easy to torment her family with these little crimes. But here was a document that Emperor wanted for a very important meeting. She would get it first. But this, this was the hardest lock she ever opened. Over and over she massaged the tumblers, gently pushing aside the four clamp that snatched at her pins, drumming the counterweights. It nearly took her a half a minute to break through the door to the Hall of Records, where the Elder Scrolls were housed. The documents were well organized by year, province and kingdom, and it looked. It took Potema only a short while to find the promise of marriage between Royal Septimus II, by the grace of course, Emperor of the Holy Surantilic Empire of Tamriel, and his daughter, the Princess Galana, and His Majesty's King Mantiarchos of Solitude. She grabbed her prize and was out of the hall with the door well locked before the page was even in sight. Back in the ballroom, she loosened the stone and listened eagerly to the conversation within. For a few minutes, the three men, the Nord, the Emperor, and her father just spoke of the better and some boring diplomatic details. Then there was the sound of footsteps and a young voice, the page. Your Imperial Majesty, I have searched the Hall of Records and cannot find the document you asked for. The you see came Potemus the you see came Potemus father's voice. I told you it didn't exist. But I saw it, the Nord's voice was furious. I was there when my leech and the Emperor signed it. I was there. Hmm, I hope you aren't doubting the word of my father, the sovereign emperor of all, Tambriel. Not when there's no now proof that you must have been mistaken. Belakius's voice was low, dangerous. Of course not, said the Nord, conceding quickly. But what will I tell my king? He is to have no connection with the imperial family and no call to return to him, as the agreement as he and I believe the agreement to be. We don't want any bad feelings between the Kingdom of Solitude and us, came the Emperor's voice, rather a feeble but clear enough. What if we offered King Mantiarko our granddaughter instead? Oh dear, dear Potema, what did you do for yourself? Potema felt the shill of the room descend on her. The Princess Potema? Is she not too young? asked the Nord. She is thirteen years old said her father. That's old enough to wait. Oh dear Potema. Yes, the karma. She would... An ideal mate for your king, said the emperor. She is admittedly, from what I see of her, very shy and innocent, but I am certain she would quickly grasp the ways of Gorge. She is, after all, a septim. I think she would be an excellent queen of solitude. Not too exciting, but noble. The granddaughter of the Emperor is not as close as his daughter, said the Nord, rather miserably. 
but I don't see how we can refuse the offer. I will send word to my king. You have our leave, said the emperor, and Potema heard the sound of the north leaving the state room. Oh dear, Potema. And yes, 13 is a bit young, yes. <laughs> Good that you are liking it. Uh, nonetheless, tears streamed down Potema's eyes. She knew who the King of Solitude was from her studies. Mantiaco, 62 years old and quite fat. And she knew how far Solitude was, and how gold in the northernmost clime. Her father and grandfather were abandoning her to the barbaric Nords. The voices in the room continued talking. Well acted, my boy. Now make sure... You burned that document, said her father. My prince, asked the page's querulous voice. The agreement between the emperor and the king of solitude, you fool. We don't want its existence known. My prince, I told the truth. I couldn't find the document in the hall of records. It seems to be missing. By Lorcan, roared her father. Why is everything in this palace always misplaced? Go back to the hall and keep searching until you find it. Potema looked at the document. Millions of gold pieces promised to the Kingdom of Solitude in the event of Princess Kalana not marrying the king. She could bring it into her father. And perhaps as a reward he would not marry her to Montiarco. Or perhaps not. She could blackmail her father and the emperor with it and make a tidy sum of money. Or she could produce it when she became Queen of Solitude to fill her coffers, and buy anything she wanted. More than a theatric katana, that was for certain. So many possibilities, Potema thought, and she found herself not bored anymore. Well, that's a good first book story at the very least. Many times marriage is organized for much younger than that, yes, but the guy who is going to be the one she's going to be marrying is quite a lot older. But yeah, I guess marriage means a different thing than it does to us. Yes, of course. <sighs> At least in this case, and considering he is already 60 years old, so. And yes, Potema does, does see the silver lining now. So the full queen, I guess Potema became the full queen then, I must say. The full queen book too. The full queen book two by 14 yard. From the pen of the 1st century 3rd era sage Mondokai. 3rd era, 82. A year after the wedding of his 14 year old granddaughter, the princess Potema, to King Mantiarko of the Nordic Kingdom of Solitude. The Emperor Uriel Septin II passed on. His son, Pelagius Septin II, was made Emperor, and he faced a greatly depleted treasury thanks to his father's poor management. As the new queen of solitude, Potema faced opposition from the old Nordic houses, who viewed her as an outsider. Mantiarko had been widowed, and his former queen was loved. She had, her, she had left him a son, Prince Bathorg, who was two years older than his stepmother, and loved her not. But the king loved his queen and suffering with her through miscarriage after miscarriage until her 29th year, when she bore him a son. So, Potema did not have very good luck in actually getting children herself, for sure, considering only at the age of 29 then. And there was, after all, the Prince Patork, who was two years older than her even, that... Uh, was also the son of <laughs> the Matiarko and so on. Ah, good, good. Good to understand. Potemus is indeed, but nothing else is said in the chat, so let's continue. Third Era 97 You must do something to help the pain, Potema cried, baring her teeth. The healer, Kelmet, immediately thought of a she-wolf in labor, but he put the image from his mind. Her enemies called her the Full Queen for certs, but not because of her any physical resemblance. Your Majesty, there is no injury for me to heal. The pain you feel is natural and helpful for the bird. 
he was going to add more words of consolation, but he had to break off to duck the mirror she flung at him. I'm not a big nosed peasant girl, big nosed. She snarled. I am the queen of solitude, daughter of the emperor. Summon the Deidre. I'll trade the soul of every last subject of mine for a little comfort. My lady, said the healer nervously, drawing the curtains and plotting out the cold morning sun. It is not wise to make such offers even in jest. The eyes of oblivion are forever watching for just a such a rash interjection. Pike nosed. Mm, that prior track such great music to rise well and then quiet, yes, Pike nosed. What would you know of Oblivion Healer? She crawled, but her voice was calmer, quieter. The bane had relaxed. Would you fetch me that mirror I hurled at you? Are you going to throw it again, your majesty? Said the healer with a taut smile, obeying her. Very likely, she said, looking at her reflection. And next time I won't miss, but I do look a fright. Is Lord Fokken still waiting for me in the hall? Yes, your majesty. Well, tell him I just need to fix my hair and I'll be with him and leave us. I'll howl for you when the pain returns. Yes, your majesty. A few minutes later, Lord Fokken was shown into the chamber. He was an enormous bald man whose friends and enemies called Mount Fokken. And when he spoke, it was with the low crumble of thunder. The queen was one of the very few people Fokken knew who was not the least bit intimidated by him. And he offered her a smile. A smile. My queen, how are you feeling? Damned, but you're looking like a spring tide has come to Mount Fokken. I take it from your merry disposition that you've been made a foshi. Only temporarily, while your husband the queen investigates whether there is evidence behind the rumors of Tresson on the part of my predecessor, Lord Tone. If you planted it as I've instructed, he'll find it, Potema smiled, propping herself up in the bed. Tell me, is Prince Bathork still in the city? What a question, your highness, laughed the mountain. It's the tournament of stamina today, you know the prince would never miss that. The fellow invent, invents new strategies to, of self-defense every, every year to show off door into games. Don't you recall last year when he entered the ring unarmored and after 20 minutes of fending off sixth place man, left the games without a scratch? He dedicated that about to his late mother, Queen Amodeta. That about. No criticism. It's good, Tim Tim. No worries. That Woken Lord thinks he's so high and mighty. Mm -hmm. Yes, I recall. He's no friend to me or you, your highness, but you must give the man his due respect. He moves like a lightning. You wouldn't think it of him, but he always seems to use his awkwardness to his advantage. To throw his opponents off. Some say he learned the style from the orcs to the south. They say he learned from them how to anticipate a false attack by some sort of a supernatural power. <sighs> There's nothing supernatural about it, said the queen quietly. He gets it from his father. Mantiago never moved like that. Woken chuckled. I never said this. He did. I never said he did, said Potema. Her eyes closed and her teeth gritted together. Uh, the pain's returning. You must fetch the healer. But first, I must ask you one other thing. Has the new summer palace construction begun? I think so, your highness. Do not think she cried gripping the sheath spiting her lips so a stream of blood tripped down her shin do make certain that the construction begins at once today your future my future and the future of this child depends on it go four hours later king Montiarco entered the room to see his son his queen smiled weakly as he gave her a kiss on the forehead when she handed him the child a tear ran down his face, another one quickly followed, and then another. My lord, she said wantly, I know you're sentimental, but really. It's not only the child, the, though he is beautiful, 
with all the fair features of his mother. Montiarco turned to his five. Sadly, his aged features twisted in agony. My dear five, there is trouble at the palace. In truth, the spirit is the only thing that keeps this day from being the darkest in my reign. What is it? Something at the tournament? Potema pulled herself up in the bed. Something with Partok? No, it isn't a tournament, but it does relate to Partork. I shouldn't worry you at a time like this. You need your rest. My husband, tell me. I wanted to surprise you with the gift after the birth of our child. So I had the old summer palace completely renovated. It's a beautiful place, or at least it was. I thought you might like it. True to tell, it was Lord Falken's idea. It used to be the Amoretta's favorite place. Bitterness crept into the king's voice. Now I've learned why. What have you learned? Asked Potema quietly. Amoretta deceived me there with my trusted warship, Lord Tone. There were letters between them, the most perverse things you've ever read. And that's not the worst of it. No? Yep. Uh, the guy isn't the son that he thought. Patrick isn't his son, obviously, no? <sighs> the dates on the letters correspond with the time of Patrick's birth. The buyer raised and loved as a son. Mantiarx's foot choked up with the emotion. He was stone child, not mine. My darling, said Potema, almost feeling sorry for the, for the old man. She wrapped her arms around his neck, and he heaves his sobs down on her and their child. Henceforth, he said quietly, Parkour is no longer my heir. He will be banished from the kingdom. This child you have born me today will grow through solitude. And perhaps more, said Potema. He is the emperor's grandson as well. We will name him Monte Argo the second. My darling, I would love that, said Pontema, kissing the king's tear-streaked face. But may I suggest Uriel, after my grandfather the emperor, who brought us together in marriage? King Monte Argo smiled at his five and nodded his face, het even. There was a knock at the door. My liege, said Mount Fokken. His Highness Prince Potter has finished the tournament and waits you to present his award. Thank you for giving subscript subscriptions. We can't find this letter, can, can we? It doesn't seem like it. I've read some perverse things, you surprise. Oh, oh you have. <laughs> Thank you, Tim Jim. Mm. We have successfully withstood attacks not by nine archers and the giant scorpion. We brought it from the Hammerville. The crowd is roaring his name. They are calling him the man who cannot be hit. I will see him, said King Mantiarco sadly, and left the chamber. Oh, he can't be hit all right, said Potema wearily, but it does take some doing. Yes. Uh, I just have a feeling, well, Potema knew this already, because we clearly, she already stated to this uh, Mount Voken that he's, he had gotten that strength from his father, and obviously it wasn't the King Montiarco, so it was this, whatever the guy's name was again. So, basically, Potema already knew it. I guess Potema might have actually gone and stolen them from one place or another, and... Uh, or found them herself, and maybe she planted them there for him to find. I do not know. And yes, I guess your subscription just ended with Sineko a little bit earlier. At least I didn't notice it had been er ended earlier, or it had ended earlier. So, thank you, Jim Jim, once again. Okay, the full queen book number two is read. Then we can go into... Book three, and there's only eight books, so ah, just a little bit more to read, eh? So, the full queen book three by Fohin Chart from the pen of the first century third era says Mundakai, 
Third Era 98. So this first tells the history, and then basically we, from this stuff that is written here, we see a little bit or read sort of a sto story indeed. And yes, only eight books, so. <sighs> the Emperor Belagius Septin II died a few weeks before the end of the year on the 15th of the evening star during the festival of North Wind's Prayer, which was considered a bad omen for the Empire. He had ruled over a difficult 17 years. In order to fill the bankrupt treasury, Pelagius had dismissed the elder council, forcing them to buy back their positions. Several good but poor councillors had been lost. Many say the emperor had died as a result of being poisoned by a vengeful former council member. Very much a possibility. His children came to attend his funeral and the coronation of the next emperor. His youngest son, Prince Magnus, 19 years of age, arrived from Almalexia, where he had been a councillor to the royal court. 21 years old, Prince Sephorus arrived from Kilana with his red guard bride, Queen Bianchi. Prince Antiochus, at 43 years of age, the eldest child and the heir presumptive, had been with his father in the imperial city. And thank you for also giving the gift subscription to Tayunta. <laughs> Mm, I've got a little bit of a budget description at the moment. Mm -hmm. And yes, ah, oh, Tayunta. Also, <laughs> Tayunta didn't have it anymore. Ah, it was quite the hunt for these books after all. It was definitely quite of a hunt. <sighs> Thank you, Jim Jim. Okay. Um, had been with his father in the Imperial City. The last to appear was his only daughter, Potema, the so-called full queen of solitude. Thirty years old and radiantly beautiful, she arrived with a magnificent entourage, accompanied by her husband, the elderly king Mantiarco, and her year-old son, Uriel. All expected Antiochus to assume the throne of the empire, but no one knew what to expect from the full queen. So Antiochus would have been the 43-year-old uh, eldest son. Third Era, 99. <sighs> Who is this? Offered the spy master. So some new voice. Uh, what voice do I use? I guess just a neutral one or approximately neutral. Lord Woken has been bringing several men to your sister's chambers late at night every night this week. Offered the spy master, perhaps if her husband were made aware. Your sister chambers. So, Potema has now suddenly had a lot of men being brought to her chambers. I wonder why. My sister is a devout of the conquered where courts remain, Reman and Talos, not the love goddess Dipella. She is plotting with those men, not having orgies with them. I'd wager I've slept with more men than he, she has, laughed Antiochus, and then grew serious. Uh, this is behind the delay of the council offering me the crown, I know it. Six weeks now. They say they need to update records and prepare for the coronation. I'm the emperor, crown me and oblivion with the formalities. Yes, he definitely isn't doing something like that, but a uh, little bit more plotting. Could we organize a Books of Skyrim series with quest voices from the snowflakes? That could be interesting for sure, Wiz. Quite interesting. You all could be bringing your voices in. Your sister is surely no friend of yours, your majesty, but there are other factors at play. Do not forget how your father treated the council. It is they who need following. And if need be, strong, convincing. The spy master added, with success, this staff of his dagger. Do so, but keep your eye on the damnable full queen as well. You know where to find me. At which prattle, your highness? inquired the spy master. Today, being Fredos, I'll be at the cat and coplin. Cat and coplin uh, brutal that he is going to be at. Ah, the future possible king. 
Sounds pretty interesting, yes, could be interesting. I just feel like someone put so much effort into these books, it could be a thing to appreciate them. Mm -hmm. True. For a certainty. The spy master noted in his report that night that the Queen Potema had no visitors, for she was dining across the Imperial Garden at the Blue Palace with her mother, the Dow Dowager Empress Quintilla. It was a warm night for winter tide and surprisingly cloudless, though the day had been stormy. The saturated ground could not take any more, so the formal structured gardens looked as if they had been glazed with water. The two women took their wine to the white balcony to look over the crowns. I believe you are trying to sabotage your half-brother's coronation, said Quintilla, not looking at her daughter. Botema saw how the years had not so much wrinkled her mother as faded her, like the sun on a stone. It's not true, said Botema, but would it bother you very much if it were true? Antiochus is not my son. He was eleven years old when I married your father, and we've never been close. I think that being heir presumptive has stunned his growth. He is old enough to have a family with grown children, and yet he spends all his time at the debauchery and fornification. He will not make a very good emperor, Quintilla sighed and tendered to Potema. But it is bad for the family for seeds of discontent to be sown. It is easy to divide up into factions, but very difficult to unite again. I fear for the future of the empire. Those sound like the words, are you, by any chance, dying, mutter. I've read the omens, said the Quintilla with a faint, ironic smile. Don't forget, I was a renowned sorceress in Camlorn. I will be dead in a few months' time. And then, not a year later, your husband will die. I only regret that I will not live to see your child, Uriel, assume the throne of solitude. Have you seen whether... Botema stopped, not wanting to reveal too many of her plans, even to a dying woman. Whether he will be the emperor? A. I know the answer to that too, daughter. Don't fear. You'll live to see the answer one way or the other. I have a gift for him when he is of age. The Dowager Emperor, Empress removed it. The Dowager Empress removed a necklace with a single great yellow gem from around her neck. It is a soul gem, infused with the spirit of a great werewolf. Your father and I defeated in battle 36 years ago. I've enchanted it with spells from the School of Illusion, so its wearer may charm whoever he chooses. An important skill for a king. Mm. And an emperor, said Potema, taking the necklace. Thank you, mutter. An hour later, passing the black branches of the sculpted dua drops, Potema noticed the dark figure, which vanished into the shadows under the eaves at her approach. She had noticed people following her before. It was one of the hazards of life in the imperial court. But this man was too close to her chambers. She slipped the necklace around her neck. Come out where I can see you, she commanded. The man emerged from the shadows, a dark little fellow of middle age, dressed in black dyed goatskin. His eyes were fixed, frozen under her spell. Who do you work for? Prince Antiochus is my master, he said in a dead voice. I am his spy. A plan formed. Is the prince in his study? No, milady. And you have Aches? Yes, milady. Hmm, Potema smiled lightly. She had him. Lead the way. The next morning, the storm reappeared in all its fury. The building and the walls and ceiling was agony to Antiochus who was discovering that he no longer had his youthful immunity to a late night of hard drinking. He shoved hard against the Argonian bench, sharing his bed. Ah, Antiochus. Hmm. And yes, interesting portal choices he has indeed. Cat and Goblin. Mm -hmm. I can see it being to some people's days. No judgment here. Yes, yes. 
he does seem to like the Kashids and Arconians more. Remember the Kashid porn that Potema found when she was really young? I think it was Antiox after all, so. And yes, Arconian when she's. Make yourself useful and close the window, he moaned. No sooner had the window been pulled at than there was a knock at the door. It was the spy master. He smiled at the prince and handed him a sheet of paper. What is this? said Antiochus, squinting his eyes. I must still be drunk. It looks like Orcus. I think you will find it useful, your majesty. Your sister is here to see you. Hmm. Yes, yeah, so exotic. The very best kind. Mm -hmm. Maybe Tayunda has experience. At least Jim Jim is taking his word for it, so... Maybe. Antiochus considered getting dressed or sending his bedmate out, but thought better of it. Show her in. Let her, uh, let her be scandalized. <laughs> good, good that you know. If Potema was scandalized, she did not show it. Swatted in orange and silver silk, she entered the room with a triumphant smile, followed by the Man Mountain, Lord Woken. Dear brother, I spoke to my mother last night, and she advised me very wisely. She said I should not battle with you in public for the good of our family and the empire. Therefore, she said, producing from the folds of her robe a piece of paper, I am offering you a choice. A choice? said Antiochus, returning her smile. That does sound friendly. Abdicate your rights to the imperial throne voluntarily, and there is no need for me to show the council this, Potema said, handing her brother the letter. It is a letter with your seal on it, saying that you knew that your father was not Pelagius Septim II, but the royal steward, Von Duke. Now, before you deny writing the letter, you cannot deny the rumors, nor that the Imperial Council will believe that your father, the old fool, was quite capable of being cuckolded. Whether it's true or not, or whether the letter is a forgery or not, the scandal of it would ruin your chances of being the Emperor. Antiochus' face had gone white with fury. Uh... I hear there's a lot of Argonians and Oblivion, eh? Scandalous. It has nothing to do with the fact of Oblivion being one of my favorite games. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Cuckolding is the worst. Yes, it is. Don't fear, brother, said Potema, taking back the letter from his shaking hands. I will see to it that you have a very comfortable life and all the force your heart or any other organ desires. Suddenly, Antiochus laughed. He looked over at his spy master and winked. I remember when you broke into my stash of Kachiti erotica and blackmailed me. That was close to 20 years ago. We've got better locks now. You must have noticed. It must have killed you that you couldn't use your own skills to get what you wanted. But the Mamiran smiled. It didn't matter. She had him. You must have shot my servant here into getting you into my study to use my seal. Antiochus smirk. A spell, perhaps, from your mother, the witch. Potema continued to smile. Her brother was cleverer than she thought. Did you know that the shard spells, even powerful ones, only last so long? Of course you didn't. You never wear one for magic. Let me tell you, a generous salary is a stronger motivation for keeping a servant in the long run, sister. Okay, should this have been actually Antiochus? <sighs> yeah, okay, I'll read this again because it was apparent Antiochus. Did you know that charm spells, even even powerful ones, only last for, for so long? Of course you didn't. You never wear one for magic. Let me tell you, a generous salary is a stronger motivation for keeping a servant in the long run, sister. Antiochus took out his own sheet of paper. Now I have a choice for you. What is that? said Potema, her smile faltering. It looks like nonsense, but if you know what you're looking for, it's very clear. It's a practice sheet. Your handwriting attempt to look like my handwriting. It's a good gift you have. 
I wonder if you haven't done this before, imitating another person's handwriting. I understand a letter was found from your husband's dead wife saying that his first son was a bastard. I wonder if you wrote that letter. I wonder if I showed his, this evidence of your gift to your husband, whether I would believe you wrote that letter. In the future, dear full queen, don't lay the same trap twice. Potema shook her head, furious, unable to speak. Give me your forgery and go take a walk in the rain. Then, later today, unhatch whatever other plots you have to keep me from the throne. Antiochus fixed his eyes on Potemas. I will be the emperor, full queen. Now go. Potema handed her brother the letter and left the room. I was wondering if they were actually real letters or if they were their watch and maybe they were maybe they weren't it's kind of difficult to know for sure and yes whoops they're not coming at least for now for a few moments out in the hallway she said nothing she merely glared at the slivers of rainwater tripping down the marble wall from a tiny unseen crack yes you will prater she said but not for very long. Yes. So how is she going to be turning that around? Well, of course, because the uh, his, her husband is going to die anyways in a couple of months too. Her mother told that she will die first in a couple of months. And a couple of months from that, her husband, who is very old, will be dying too. So then that blackmail will have nothing against her. So... Yes, getting interesting. We'll need to adjust those letters for ourselves. Uh huh. Yes, indeed. The Full Queen book for by Fulkin Yard from the pen of the first century Third Era Sage Mundagai. Third Era 109. Ten years after being crowned Emperor of Tamriel, Antiochus Septim had impressed his subjects with little but the enormity of his lust for carnal pleasures. By his second wife, Jusilla, he had a daughter in the year 104, who he named Kintura, after his great-great-great-grand-aunt, the Empress. Enormously fat and marked by every venereal disease known to the healers, Antiochus spent little time on politics. His disciples, by marked contrast, excelled in this field. Magnus had, a, had married Helena, the Sorrentil Queen of Lilmot, the Arconian priest king having been executed, and was representing the imperial interest in Black March admirably. Zephyrus and his wife Bianchi were ruling the Hammerfell kingdom of Shilana with a healthy brood of children. But no one was more politically active than Potema, the wolf queen of the Skyrim kingdom of solitude. Alright, hopefully you will be back soon. Full series, narration stream, pretty much. I think we will be reading this full series through because I don't think it's going to be fun to leave it unfinished. So I'll be reading it through. Hopefully you don't, guys don't mind me reading this series through. Nine years after the death of her husband, King Montiarco, Potema still ruled as regent for her young son Uriel. Their court had become very fashionable, particularly for rulers who had a crutch to bear against the emperor. All the kings of Skyrim visited Castle Solitude regularly, and over the years emissaries from the lands of Morrowind and High Rock did as well. Some guests came from even future away. The Dera 110 Bodema stood at the harbor and watched the boat from Piondonia arrive. Against the cray breaking waves where she had been so many where she had seen so many vessels of Tamrielic manufacture. It looked less than exotic. Insectoid, certainly, with its membranous sails and rubbed chitin hull. Good, good that you don't mind, Tayunta. It's good that it's interesting. Uh, insectoid, certainly, with its membranous sails and rubbed chitin hull. But she had been similar, had seen similar, if not identical, sea craft in Morrowind. No, if not for the flak, which was markedly alien, she would not have picked out the ship from others in the harbor. As the salty mist ballooned around her, she held out her hand in welcome to the visitors from another island empire. The men aboard were not merely pale, they were entirely colorless, as if their flesh were made of some 
white, limpid jelly, but she had been forewarned. At the arrival of the king and his translator, she looked directly into their blank eyes and offered her hand. The king made noises. His great majesty, King Orknum, said the translator haltingly, expresses his delight at your beauty. He thanks you for giving him refuse from these dangerous seas. You speak Cyrandelic very well, said Fotema. I am fluent in the languages of four continents, said the translator. I can speak to the denizens of my own country, Puertonia, as well as those of Atmora, Akavir, and here in Tamriel. Yours is the easiest, actually. I was looking forward to this voyage. Please tell his highness that he is welcome here, and that I am entirely at his disposal, said Potema, smiling. Then she added, You understand the context, that I am just being polite? Of course, said the translator, and then made several noises at the king, which the king reacted to with a smile. While they conversed, Potema looked up the dock and saw the now familiar grey cloak watching her while they spoke with Levlet, Antiochus' man. Antiochus's. The Pishik order from the Somerset Isle. Very bothersome. My diplomat emissary Lord Fokken will show you to your rooms, said Potema. Unfortunately, I have some other quests as well who require my attention. I hope your great majesty understands. His Majest Great Majesty King Orknum did understand, and Potema made arrange arrangements to dine with the Buandunians that evening. Meeting with the Pishik Order required all of her concentration. She dressed in her simplest black and gold robe and went to her stationed room to prepare. Her son, Uriel, was on the throne, playing with his pet Yokot. Good morning, Mom. Good morning, darling, said Potema, lifting her son in the air with fate and stain. Talos, but you're heavy. I don't think I've even carried such a heavy ten-year-old. That's probably good because I'm eleven, said Uriel, perfectly aware of his mother's tricks. And you're going to say that as an eleven-year-old, I should probably be with my tutor. I was fanatical about studying at your age, said Potema. I'm a king, said Uriel petulantly. But don't be satisfied with that, said Potema. By all rights, you should be emperor already. You understand that, don't you? Uriel nodded his head. Potema took a moment to marvel at his likeness to the portraits of Tiber Septim. The same ruthless brow and powerful shin. When he was older and lost his baby fat, he'd be a splitting image of his great, 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 great grandangle. Behind her, she heard the door opening and an usher bringing in several grey cloaks. She stiffened slightly, and Uriel on cue jumped down from the throne and left the stateroom, pausing to greet the most important of the psychics. Good morning, Majest Master Yashesis, he said, enuishing each syllable with a recall accent that made Potemus' heart sore. I hope your accommodations at Castle Solitude meet with your approval. They do, King Uriel, thank you, said Yakesis, delighted and charmed. Yakesis and his psychic entered the chamber and the door was shut behind them. Potemus sat only for a moment on the throne before stepping off the dice and creating her quests. I am so sorry to have kept you waiting, said Potema. To think that you sailed all the way from the Somerset Isles and I should keep you waiting any longer. You must forgive me. It's not at all that long of a voyage, said one of the grey cloaks angrily. It isn't as if we sailed all the way from Virginia. Ah, you've seen my most recent quest, King Orknum and his retinue, said Potema breezily. I suppose you think it is unusual me entertaining them. As we all know, the Puritanians mean to invade Tamriel. You are, I take it, as neutral in this as you are in all political matters? Of course, said Yakisis proudly. We have nothing to gain or lose by the invasion. The Physic Order preceded the organization of Tamriel under Septim Dynasty, and we shall survive under any political regime. Rather like a flea on whatever mongrel happens along, are you? said Potemon, narrowing her eyes. 
Don't over overestimate your importance, Yakisis. Your author's child, the Mage's Guild, has twice the power you have, and they are entirely on my side. We are in the process of making an agreement with King Orknu. When the Pyrdiamans take over and I am in my proper place as Empress of this continent, then you shall know your proper place in the Order of Things. Alrighty, just a question. Okay, with narration. Any other they should have set? Yes. Good, good that everyone is okay with this. With a majestic stride, Potema left the state room, leaving the grey cloaks to look from one to the other. Um, we must speak to Lord Levlet, said one of the grey cloaks. Yes, said the Achilles. Perhaps we should. Levlet was quickly found at his usual place at the Moon and Nausea Tavern. <laughs> Nausea Tavern? Moon and Nausea Tavern. Okay then. Moon and Nausea. Would you guys want to be staying at the Moon and Nausea Tavern? Would you or would you not? <sighs> As the three cray cloaks entered, led by Iakisis, the smoke and the noise seemed to die in their path. Even the smell of tobacco and Flynn dissipated in their wake. He rose and then escorted them to a small room upstairs. Makes me nauseous to think about it. <laughs> Sounds pleasant, yes. You've reconsidered, said Levlet with a proud smile. Your emperor, said Yakisis, and then corrected himself. Our emperor originally asked for our support in defending the west coast of Tamriel from the Pudian fleet in return for 12 million gold pieces. We offered our services at 50. Upon reflection on the dangers that the Pudian invasion would have, we accept his earlier offer. The Mage's Guild has generously, perhaps for a low ten million gold pieces, said Yakisis quickly. Hmm. I would strongly think their drinks are spiced. Yes, that's probably the case. <laughs> Buck sheep, yes. Um, over the course of dinner, Potema promised King Orknum to the interpreter to lead an insurrection against her father. She was delighted to discover that her capacity for lying worked many different cultures. Potema shared her bet that night with King Orknum, as it seemed the polite and diplomatic thing to do. Well, at least her husband was already dead, I think, anyway, so uh, in that sense... Uh, as it turned out, he was one of the better lovers she had ever had. He gave her some hers before beginning that made her feel as if she was floating on the surface of time, conscious only of the gestures of love after she had found herself making them. She felt herself like the cooling mist, quenching the fire of his lust over and over and over again. In the morning, when he kissed her on the cheek and said with his bold white eyes that he was leaving her, she felt a stab of re regret. Stab of regret, and yes, very diplomatic. The ship left harbor that morning, en route to the Somerset Isles and their imminent invasions. She waved them off to the sea as she footsteps, um, as she heard footsteps behind her. It was Levlet. They will do it for eight million, your highness, he said. Thank Mara, said Potema. I need more time for an insurrection. Pay them from my treasury and then go to the Imperial City and get the 12 million from Antiochus. We should make a good profit from this game and you, of course, will have your share. Three months later, Potema heard that the fleet of the Pyondianians had been utterly destroyed by a storm that had appeared suddenly off the Isle of Artium, the home port of the Psychic Order. King Orknum and all of his ships had been utterly annihilated. Ah, poor King Orknum. Ah, sometimes making people hate you, she said, holding her son Uriel close. It's how you make profit. Yes, that's the way to make profit. You learned it from her, the full queen. Ah, 
only we are halfway, halfway through the books. And yes, very impressive for sure, Wiz. Okay, the Full Queen, book five, five four yard from the pen of Insoligus, second century sage and student of Mondokai. Third era, 119. For 21 years, the Emperor Antiochus Septim ruled Tamriel and proved an able leader despite his moral laxity. His greatest victory was in the War of the Isle in the year 110, when the Imperial fleet and the Royal Navies of Summered Isle, together with the magical powers of Bishik Order, succeeded in destroying the Beardinians' invading armada. His siblings, King Magnus of Lilmot, King Zephyrus of Gilana, and Potema, the Will Queen of Solitude, ruled well and relations between the Empire and the kingdoms of Tamriel were much improved. Still, centuries of neglect had not repaired all the scars that existed between the Empire and the kings of Hyrok and Skyrim. During a rare visitation from his sister and nephew Uriel, Antiochus, who had suffered from several illnesses over his reign, lapsed into a coma. For months he lingered in between life and death, while the elder council prepared for the ascension of his 15-year-old daughter, Kintira, to the throne. Hmm. I realize that these books have certain themes that may be present in the following game as well. Me, at least I don't know who this Uriel is that is the full queen's son, but uh, this Uriel is probably, I don't know which Uriel Septim it will be, but it, he definitely will get to be the emperor, I'm sure of that. At least the way it's been going, yeah. I know I've probably said this before, but I never connected with uh, connected with the story of Elder Scrolls when playing at the actual game, not like with Kid's story time. Yeah, this tells the story way better than the games tell it. To be honest, it would be nice if there would be a game, but I don't think that Oblivion also told very well about the emperors or the any of them. Or the real Barencia book tells way better of the what all has gone on during that time in. In, in Morrowind, though, as such, that story, partially at least, is also present in the, I think, was it the Daggerfall game? Possibly. Prose writers, mm, it told nothing. Yes, that's the thing. It's a shame. It's a shame that it didn't tell anything of those things. But okay, Third Era, 120. Mutter, I can't marry Kintara, said Uriel, more amused by the suggestion than offended. She's my first cousin, and besides, I believe she's engaged to one of the laws of Council Modellus. You're so squeamish, there's a time and a place for propriety, said Potema. But you're correct, at any rate, about Modellus, uh, and we shouldn't offend the Elder Council at this critical juncture. How do you feel about Princess Rakma? You spend a good deal of time in her company in Faerun. She's alright, said Uriel. Don't tell me you want to hear all the dirty details. <sighs> Please spare me your study of her anatomy, Potema grimaced. But would you marry her? I suppose so. Very good, I'll make the arrangements then, Potema made a note for herself before continuing. King Leramo has been a difficult ally to keep, and a political marriage should keep Faerun on our sa side. Should we need them? When is the funeral? What funeral, asked Uriel? You mean for Uncle Antiochus? <sighs> of course, sighed at Potema. Anyone else of note die recently? There were a bunch of little red card children running through the halls, so I guess Zephyrus has arrived. Magnus arrived at court yesterday, so it ought to be any day now. <sighs> it's time to address the court, then, said Potema, smiling, council even. She dressed in black, not her usual colorful ensembles. It was important to look the part of the grieving sister. Regarding herself in the mirror, she felt that she looked all of her 53 years. A shock of silver wound its way through her auburn hair. 
The long, cold, dry winters in northern Skyrim had created a map of wrinkles, thin as a spider web, all across her face. Still, she kn knew that when she smiled, she could win hearts, and when she frowned, she could inspire fear. It was enough for her purposes. But Emma's speech to the Elder Council is perhaps helpful to students of public speaking. She began with flattery and self abasement My most august and wise friends, members of the Elder Council, I am but a provincial queen, and I can only assume to bring to issue what you yourself must have already pondered. She continued on to praise the late emperor who had been a popular ruler despite his flaws. He was a true septim and a great warrior, destroying, with your counsel, the near invisible, invincible armada of Pioneeria. But little time was wasted before she came to her point. The Empress Jusalia unfortunately did nothing to temper my brother's lustful spirits. In point of fact, no fur in the slums in the city spread out on more beds than she. Had she attended to her duties in the imperial bedchamber more faithfully, we would have a true heir to the empire, not the Harwind milks of pastors who called themselves the Emperor's children. The girl called Kintira is popularly believed to be the daughter of Chisilla and the captain of the guard. It may be that she is the daughter of Chisilla and the boy who cleans the cisterns. We can never know for certain. Not as certainly as we can know the lineage of my son, Uriel, the eldest true son of the Septim dynasty. My lords, the princes of the Empire will not stand for a bastard on the throne. That I can assure you. She ended mildly, but with a call to action. Posterity will judge you, you know what must be done. That evening, Botema entertained her brothers and their wives in the map room, her favorite of the imperial dining chambers. The walls were splashed with bright, invading representations of the empire and all the known lands beyond Atmora, Yokunda, Akavir, Pyodiana, Treas. Overhead, the great glass domed ceiling, wet with rain, displayed distorted images of the stars overhead. The lightning flashed every other minute, casting strange pandom shadows on the walls. Uh, I wonder if Gide had to read enough to pass for a scholar in Morrowind World. Mm -mm, maybe, maybe at some point. Master of Morrowind lore. Not quite, not quite, but uh, we are definitely getting closer to being masters at some point. <sighs> When will you speak to the council? As Potema as a dinner was served. I don't know if I will, said Magnus. I don't believe I have anything to say. I'll speak to them when they announce the coronation of Kintira, said Severus, merely as a formality to show my support and the support of Hammerfell. You can speak for all of Hammerwell, asked Potema with a teasing smile. The Red Gods must love you very much. We have a unique relationship with the Empire in Hammerfell, said Sephiroth's wife Bianchi. Since the Treaty of Strokos Makai, it's been understood that we are part of the Empire, but not the subject. I understand you've already spoken to the Council, said Magnus's wife Helena pointedly. <sighs> I read Magnus, I thought it was a man. Helena, I understand you've already spoken to the Council, said Magnus's wife Helena pointedly. She was a diplomat by nature, but as the Surendilic ruler of the Argonian kingdom, she knew how to recognize and confront adversity. Yes, I have, said Potema, pausing to savor a slice of braised jalf bird. I gave them a short speech about the coronation this afternoon. Our sister is an excellent public speaker, said Sephiroth. You're too kind, said Potema, laughing. I do many things better than speaking. Sasas asked Bianchi, smiling. Might I ask what you said in your speech? asked Magnus suspiciously. There was a knock on the chamber door. The head steward whispered something to Potema, who smiled in response and rose from the table. I told the council that I would give my full support to the coronation, provided they proceed with wisdom. 
What could be sinister about that? Potema said and took her glass of wine with her to the door. If you'll pardon me, my niece Kintira wishes to have a word with me. Hmm. <laughs> it's like you're doing it live, isn't it? Mind buckling, isn't it? Yes, doing all the voices too. Trying to do my best, but it's not like all of them are that good. <sighs> Kintira stood in the hall with the Imperial Guard. She was but a child, but on reflection, Potema realized that at her age, she was already married two years to Montiarco. There was a similarity, to be certain. Potema could see Kintira as the young queen, with dark eyes and pallid skin, smooth and resolute like marble. Anger flashed momentarily in Kintira's eyes on seeing her aunt, but emotion left her, replaced with calm, imperial presence. Queen Pontema, she said serenely, I have been informed that my coronation will take place in two days' time. Your presence at the ceremony will not be welcome. I have already given orders to your servants to have your belongings packed, and an escort will be accompanying you back to your kingdom tonight. That is all. Goodbye, aunt. Potena began to reply, but Kintara had her guard turned and moved back down the corridor to the state room. The full queen watched them go, and the re then re-entered the map room. Sister-in-law, said Pontema, addressing Bianchi with deep male malevolence. You ask what I do better than speaking. The answer is war. So I guess Skyrim will be going to war. You know, as a kid, one of my favorite shows on TV was just some guy telling stories says something when the spoken words make better pictures than the animations of the time. Mm. True enough, true enough, Chim Chim. A little bit of a shorter book, so that's kinda nice. Three more books. Wolf Queen, book six by Falkling Yard. From the pen of Insolicus, second century sage. Third era, 120. The 15-year-old Empress Kintira Septim II, daughter of the Antiochus, was coronated on the third day of first seat. Her uncles Magnus, king of Lilmot, and Xephorus, king of Zelana, were in attendance, but her aunt, Potema, the full queen of solitude, had been banished from the court. Once back in her kingdom, Queen Potema began assembling the rebellion, what was to be known as the War of the Red Diamond. All the allies she had made over the years of disgruntled kings and nobles joined forces with her against the new empress. The first early strikes against the empire were entirely successful. Throughout Skyrim and Northern High Rock, the imperial army found themselves under attack. Thank you for the share, Jim Jim. Okay. Need to be looking into that later, Jim Jim. You can do it, Gita. Slay those full queen books. We'll do that. We will certainly do that. <sighs> the first early strikes against the Empire were entirely successful. Throughout Skyrim and Northern High Rock, the Imperial Army found themselves under attack. But Emma and her forces fast overwhelmed Umbria like a plague, inciting riots and insurrections everywhere they touched. In the autumn of the year, the loyal Duke of Glenpoint to the coast of High Rock sent an urgent request for reinforcements from the Imperial Army, and Kintira, to inspire the resistance to the full queen, led the army herself. That's dangerous for a certainty to lead the army herself even. Third Era 121 We don't know. Okay. We don't know where they are, said the Duke, deeply in Paris. I've sent scouts out all over the countryside. I can only assume that they've been retreated up north upon hearing of your army's arrival. I hate to say it, but I was hoping for a battle, said Kintira. I'd like to put my aunt's head on a spike and parade it around the Empire. Her son Uriel and his army are right on the border of the Imperial Province, mocking me. How are they able to be so successful? Are they just that good in battle, or do my subjects truly hate me? She was tired after many months of struggling through the mud of autumn and winter. Crossing the Dragon Tail Mountains, her army nearly marched into an ambush. A blizzard snapped into the normal, the temperate parony of Twinen was so unexpected and severe that it must certainly have been cast by one of the Potema's wizard allies. 
Everywhere she turned, she felt her own touch. And now, her chance of facing the full queen at last had been thwarted. It was almost too much to bear. It is fear, pure and simple, said the duke. That is her greatest weapon. I need to ask, said Kintira, hoping that by sheer will she could keep her voice from revealing any of the fear the duke spoke of. You've seen the army? Is it true that she has summoned a force of undead warriors to do her bidding? No, as a matter of fact, it's not true. But she certainly fosters that rumor. Fosters. Her army attacks at night, partly for strategic reasons and partly for advantage, advanced views like that. She has so far, as I know, no supernatural aid other than the standard battle mages and night plays of any modern army. Always at night, said Gintira thoughtfully. I suppose that's to disguise their numbers. And to move her troops into position before we are aware of them, added the duke. She's the master of the sneak attacks. When you hear a march to the east, you can be certain she's already on top of you from the south. But listen, we'll discuss this all tomorrow morning. I've prepared the castle's best rooms for you and your men. Kira's voices just make me miss Okami. <laughs> I can understand that. How did we get to the rebellion so quick? Well, there was the history part with red text first and then... That just simply told how things are now and then we are telling this story. Uh, I used to rent radio plays from the library as a kid now that I think they were pretty much just books read aloud. Mm. Shakespeare wasn't made popular as literature but because it was performed. Yes, true enough too. Hmm. I haven't listened to good radio plays either, to be honest. Kintira sat in her tower suit, and by the light of the moon and a single tallow candle, she penned a letter to her, hus her husband-to-be, Lord Modellus, back in the Imperial City. She hoped to be married to him in the summer at the Blue Palace her grandmother Quintilla had loved so much. But the war may not permit it. As she wrote, she gazed out of the window and the courtyard below, and the haunted leafless trees of winter. Two of her guards stood on the battlements, several feet away from the one another. Just like Morellus and Kintira, she thought, and proceeded to expound on the metaphor in her letter. A knock on the door interrupted her, interrupted her poetry. A letter, young majesty, from Lord Morellus, said the young courtier, handing the note to her. It was short, and she read it quickly before the courtier had a chance to retire. I'm confused by something. When did he write this? One week ago, said the courtier. He said it was urgent that I make it here as quickly as possible while he mobilized the army. I imagine they've left the city already. Kintira dismissed the courtier. Modelo said that he had received a letter from her, urgently calling for reinforcements to the battle at Glen Point. But there was no battle at Glen Point, and she had only just arrived today. Then Fu wrote the letter in her handwriting, and why would they want Modellus to bring a second army out of the Imperial City into High Rock? Well, either they're gonna indeed surround you guys there, or they're gonna take the capital while you guys are there, which is the probable case. And of course, we know Fu has written on her handwriting. It's obviously not going to be the full queen herself. Of course, she is known from that after all, Potema indeed. And yes, there is a plenty of a lot of good books. <laughs> and thank you for again gifting the uh, subscription to Saten Denho on the other hand. Hmm. Thank you kindly. Feeling a shield from the night air at the window, Kintira went to the sh went to shut the latch. The two guards on the battlements were gone. She leaned over at the sound of a muffled struggle behind one of the barren trees, and did not hear the door open. When she turned, she saw the Queen Potema and Mendin, Duke of Glenpoint, in the room with the host of guards. 
You move quietly, aunt, she said after a moment's pause. She turned to the duke. What turned you against your loyalty to the empire? Fear? And gold, said the duke simply. What happened to my army? Asked Kintira, trying to look Potema steadily in the face. Is the battle over so soon? All your men are dead, smiled Potema. But there was no battle here, merely quiet and efficient assassination. There will be battles ahead against Modellus in the Dracon Tail Mountains and against the remnants of the Imperial Army in the city. I'll send you regular updates on the progress of the war. So I am to be kept here as your hostage? Asked Kintira flatly, suddenly aware of the solid solidity of the stones at the great high of her tower room. Damn you. Look at me, I'm your empress. Think of it this way, I'm taking you from being a fifth-rate ruler to a first-rate martyr, said Potema with a wink. But I understand if you don't want to thank me for that. Well, that was also a short book, to be honest. So, we're doing good progress with this. Every time there's loot happening, yes. <laughs> And yes, they are very much useful. Lots of span of loot. Though, I don't know if that was loot, but uh, yes. Spam this emote to make it a hoot. Hoot? Hoot hoot. Sure, okay. If you want to be hoot hoot. Or do you want me to go and leave actually the loot stuff and not read the <laughs> series at the end? Well, to be honest, we are quite close. Only two more books that I do. I should probably watch other streams live to spread the joy. Just really suck using emotes. Hmm. Hmm. But it is a very nice emote. Okay, so again, history part then. So the Folk Queen, Book 7 by Fohin Yard. From the pen of Insolicus, 2nd century sage. 3rd era, 125. The exact date of the Empress Kintira Septin's 2nd execution in the Tower of the Glen Point Castle is open to some speculations. So she was indeed executed even. Some believe she was slain shortly after her imprisonment in the 121st year, while others maintain that she was likely kept alive as a hostage until shortly before her uncle Sephorus, King of Kilain, reconquered Western High Rock in the summer of the 125th year. The certainty of Kintira's demise rallied many against the folk queen Potema and her son, who had been crowned Emperor Uriel Septin III, four years previously when he invaded the underguarded Imperial City. Yes, took the Imperial City and then crowned to be the Emperor. Severus concentrated his army on the war in High Rock, while his brother Magnus, King of Lilmot, brought his Argonian troops through loyal Morrowind and into Skyrim to fight the Potema's home province. The reptilian troops fought well in the summer months, but during the winter they retired south to recruit and attack again when the weather was warm. At this stalemate, the war lasted out two more years. Also, in the 125th year, Magnus's wife Helena gave birth to their first child, a boy who they named Pelagius, after the emperor who fathered Magnus, Sephoros, the late Emperor Antiochus and the dreadful Queen of Solitude. Uh, span this emote to make it feel like a Viking. Mm -hmm. Nothing rhymes with loot, I have realized. Or I am I dumb? Is it because I am dumb? Is it boot suit? Uh, good question. Not much rhymes with it. Nothing that makes sense anyway. Is that all you got? <laughs> Loot the boot. Loot the root. Root into looting. <sighs> not much, not much, toot. Mm. Well, third era 127. Potema sat on a soft silk cushions in the warm grass in the front in front of her tent and watched the sun rise over the dark woods on the other side of the meadow. It was a peculiarly vibrant morning, typical to Skyrim's summer tide. 
The high sheer up of insects passed all around her, and the sky surged with thousands of following birds, rolling over one another and forming a multitude of patterns. Nature was unaware of the war coming to Falcon Star, she surmised. Your Highness, a message from the army in Hammerfell, said one of her mates. Bringing in a courtier, he was pretty hard, stained with sweat and mud, evidence of a long fast ride over many, many miles. My queen, said the courier, looking to the crown, I bring brave news of your son, the emperor. He met your brother, King Sephiroth's army in Hammerfell in the countryside of Inj Ishitak, and there did battle. You would be proud, for he fought well, but in the end the imperial army was defeated and your son, your emperor, our emperor, was captured. King Sephiroth is bringing him to Gilan. Potema listened to the news, scrawling. Scowling. That clumsy fool, she said at last. Potema stood up and strolled into camp, where the men were arming themselves, preparing for battle. Long ago, the soldiers understood that their lady did not stand on ceremony, and she would prefer that they would work, they work rather than salute her. Lord Fokken was ahead of her, already meeting with the commander of the battle mages, discussing the last minute strategy. Cute, toot. Damn it, now my language looks weird to me. <laughs> uh, is it different in a way by foreign ears don't recognize? Shoot. This is taking quite a humorous turn. Yes. Shoot does work, kinda. Looting and shooting. Shooting and looting, right? You usually have to shoot after all if you wanna be looting. Usually. So. My queen, said the courier, who had been following her, what are you going to do? I'm going to win this battle with Magnus, despite his superior position holding the ruins of Kogmetri's castle, said Potema, and then, when I know that Sephiroth means to do with the Emperor, I'll respond accordingly. If there's a ransom to be paid, I'll pay it. If there's a prison exchange needed, so be it. Now please, pat yourself and rest, and try not to get in the way of the war. It's not an ideal scenario, said Lord Woken when Potema had entered the commander's tent. If we attack the castle from the west, we'll be running directly into the fire from their mages and archers. If we come from the east, we'll be going through swamps. And the Arconians do better in that type of environment than we do. A lot better. Hmm. What about the north and south? Just hills, correct? Very steep hills, your highness, said the commander. We should post Bowman there, but we'll be too vulnerable putting out the majority of our force. Hmm, so it's the swamp, said Potema, and added pragmatically, unless we withdraw and wait for them to come out before fighting. If we wait, Sephiroth will have his arm here from High Rock, and we'll be trapped between the two of them, said Lord Woken. Not a preferable situation. Hmm... I'll talk to the troops, said the commander. Try to prepare them for the swamp attack. No, said Potema. I'll speak to them. You may not like it, but this is what Big Cute looks like. <laughs> uh, other stream means. Hmm. Alrighty, Jim Jim. In full battle gear, the soldiers scattered in the center of camp. They were a motley collection of men and women, Surundils, Nords, Bretons and Dummer, young bloods and old veterans, the sons and daughters of nobles, shopkeepers, serfs, priests, prostitutes, farmers, academics, adventurers, all of them under the banner of the Red Diamond, the symbol of the imperial family of Tamriel. My children, Potema said, her voice ringing out, hanging in the still morning mist, we have fought in many battles together, over mountain tops and beach heads, through forests and deserts. We have seen great acts of valor from each one of you, which does my heart proud. I have also seen dirty fighting, backstabbing, cruel and wanton feats of savagery, which pleases me equally well, for you are all warriors. Warming to her team, Potema walked the line from soldier to soldier, looking each one in the eye. 
war is in your blood, in your brain, in your muscles, in everything you think and everything you do. When this war is over, when the forces are vanquished that seek to deny the throne to the true emperor, Uriel Septim III, you may cease to be warriors. You may choose to return to your lives before the war, to your farms and your cities, and show off your scars and tell tales of the deeds you did this, to, uh, this day to your wandering neighbors. But on this day, make no mistake, you are warriors. You are war. So you could see her vo words were working. All around her, bloodshot eyes were focusing on slaughter to come, arms tensing around weapons. She continued her, her loudest cry, and you will move through the swamplands like an unstoppable power from the blackest part of oblivion, and you will rip the scales from the reptilian things in Kopmeri's castle. You are warriors, and you need not only fight, you must win. You must win. The soldiers roared in response, shocking the birds from the trees all around the camp. From a vantage point on the hills to the south, Potema and Lord Fokken had excellent views of the battle as it raged. It looked like two swarms of two colors of insect moving back and forth over the clumps of dirt which was the castle ruins. Occasionally, a burst of flame or a cloud of acid from one of the mages would flicker over the battle arresting their attention, but hour after hour the fighting seemed like nothing but chaos. The rider approaches, said Lord Fokken, breathing the silence. Uh, you're glad it suffice. It is a very cute emote. <laughs> it does this mean I have to do more cute emotes? I'm still recovering from this one. <laughs> it was almost dramatic. I'm sorry, Tayuda, that you had made a cute emote. But yes, it's a very cute one, and we honor your sacrifice. That came out wrong. It was worth suffering, yes. Seriously, it's a fun, fucking fantastic emote, and you should be proud. And yes, definitely. I love it. Just a shame that we can't have more first tire emotes for a certainty. The suffering, the sweet suffering. <laughs> yes. Okay. The young red guard woman was wearing the crest of Gilana but carried a white flag. Potema allowed her to approach, like the courier from the morning. The rider was fell travel-worn. Your Highness, she said out of breath, I have been sent from your brother, my lord King Sephiroth, to bring you tired news. Your son Uriel was captured in Ishidak, on the fields in battle and from there transported to Gilane. I know all this, said Potema scornfully. I have couriers of my own. You can tell your master that after I've won this battle, I'll pay whatever ransom or exchange. Your Highness, an angry crowd made, met the caravan your son was in before it made it to Kilana. The rider said quickly, your son is dead. He had been burned to death within his carriage. He is dead. Great. So he got killed in that sort of a way. But Emma turned from the young woman and looked down at the battle. Her soldiers were going to win. Magnus's army was in retreat. Retreat. One other item of news, your highness, said the writer. King Sephiroth is being proclaimed emperor. Potema did not look at the woman. Her army was celebrating their victory. So they won the battle, but uh, the one that was supposed to rule, her son, is dead. So it wasn't really worth the battle then anymore, was it? Wasn't a worth the battle no more. So that was book seven, and then seems to be going for a sad, sad ending. Won the battle, but lost the war, basically, because if the emperor that was supposed to be the emperor, real Septim the third, isn't going to be there, then obviously enough, well, not really a possibility then, a eh? Not really a battle won. And yes, book 8 is the finale. Yes. I heard that there's supposed to be 8 books, so this is going to be the last book to tell what happens with the Wolf Queen. The Wolf Queen, book 8 by Four Hinge Yard, from the pen of Insolicus, 2nd century sage. Third era, 127. 
following of the Battle of Ishidak, the Emperor Real Septin III was captured, and before he was able to be brought to his uncle's castle in the Hammerfell Kingdom of Kilane, he met his death at the hands of an angry mob. This uncle, Sephorus, was thereafter proclaimed emperor and rode to the imperial city. The troops, formerly loyal to Emperor Uriel and his mother, the full queen, Potema, pledged themselves to the new emperor. In return for their support, the nobility of Skyrim, High Rock, Hammerfell, and Somerset Isle, Valenwood, Black March, and Morrowind demanded and received a new level of autonomy and independence from the Empire. Oh, so this is why they had got more independence, basically. Because if Uriel Septin the third would have actually been alive, they would have all been specifically not that independent or autonomous, but here then to actually pledge allegiance to this new emperor again, they wanted more autonomous position and independence from the empire. The War of the Red Diamond was at an end. Potema continued to fight a losing battle, her area of influence dwindling and dwindling until only her kingdom of solitude remained in her power. She summoned Deidre to fight for her. Had her necromancers resurrect her fallen enemies as undead warriors? and mounted attacks after attacks on the forces of her brothers, the Emperor Sephiroth Septim I and King Magnus of Lilmot. Her allies began leaving her as her madness crew, and her only companions were the zombies and skeletons she had amassed over the years. The Kingdom of Solitude became a land of death. Stories of the ancient folk queen being waited on by rotting skeletal chambermaids and holding war plans with vampiric generals terrified their subjects. Oh well. Oh man, using necromancers is just making you look desperate. Well, yes. Of course, if she gave up, they might just simply be wanting to anyways execute her, on the other hand, so... Well, Third Era 137. Magnus opened up the small window in his room. For the first time in weeks, he heard the sounds of a city. Cards squeaking, horses clopping over the club or a cobblestones, and somewhere a child laughing. He smiled as he returned to his bedside to wash his face and finish dressing. There was a distinctive knock on the door. Come in, Belle, he said. Bellacius bounded into the room. It was obvious that he had been up for hours. Magnus marveled at his energy and wondered how much longer battles would last if they were run by a 12-year-old boy. Did you see outside yet? Bellacius asked. All the dance people have come back. There are shops and a maid is killed and down by the harbor I saw a hundred shops come in from all over the place. They don't have to be afraid anymore. We've taken care of all the zombies and ghosts that used to be their neighbors. And they know it's safe to come back. Is Uncle Sephiroth going to turn into a zombie when he dies? Asked Bellacius. I wouldn't put that past him. <laughs> Why do you ask? I heard some people saying that he was old and sick, said Bellacius. He's not that old, said Magnus. He's 60 years old, that's just two years older than I. And how old is Aunt Potema? asked Bellacius. Seventy, said Magnus. And yes, that is old. Any more questions will have to wait. I have to go meet with the commander now. But we can talk at supper. You can make yourself busy and not get into any trouble. Yes, sir, said Bellacius. He understood that his father had to continue to hold siege to Aunt Potema's castle. After they took it over and locked her up, they would move out of the inn and into the castle. Bellacius was not looking forward to that. The whole town had a funny, sweet, dead smell, but he could not get even as close as the castle moat without gagging from the stench. They could dump a million flowers on the place and it wouldn't make any difference at all. He walked through the city for hours, buying some food and then some ribbons for his sister, and muttered back in Lilamot. He thought about who else he needed to buy gifts for, and was stumped. All his cousins, the children of Uncle Sephoros, Uncle Antiochus, and Aunt Potema, had died during the war. Some of them in battle, and some of them during the famine because so many crops had been burned. 
Oh dear, everyone had died. Aunt Bianchi had died last year. There was only he, his mother, his sister, his father, and his uncle the emperor left, and Aunt Potema. But she didn't really count. Oh dear. How old these people live? <laughs> That's a good question. How old? I don't know. I like to spam hordes of zombies in Total War Warhammer or skeletons. Hmm. I guess it depends on where you deploy necromancers. Like, it's fine starting out with necromancy, but if it turn out, turns out as an easy answer for your recruitment problems, desperate. <laughs> Kinda true. When he came upon the Mage's Guild earlier that morning, he had decided not to go in. Those places always spooked him with their strange smoke and crystals and old books. This time, it occurred to Belagius that he might buy a gift for Angle Sephorus, a souvenir of Solitude's Mage's Guild. An old woman was having trouble with the front door, so Belagius opened it for her. Thank you, she said. She was easily the oldest thing he had ever seen. Her face looked like an old rotted apple. I have a feeling that this is the full queen, <laughs> in all honesty. Her face looked like the old rotted apple, framed with her wild twirl of bright white hair. He instinctively moved away from her knarled talon when she started to pat him on the head. But there was a gem around her neck that immediately fascinated him. Yep, 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 bright yellow jewel. It is indeed, indeed, Potema, definitely. It was a single bright yellow jewel, but it almost looked there was something trapped within. When the light hit it from the candles, it brought out the form of a four legged beast, pacing. It's a soul gem, she said, infused with the spirit of a great demon fearful. It was enchanted long, long ago with the power to charm people, but I've been thinking about giving it another spell. Perhaps something from the school of alteration like lock or shield. She pauses and looked at the boy careful with yellowed, roamy, fumy eyes. You look familiar to me, boy. What's your name? Hmm, what's your name? And yes, crystals. Your main tactic tactic it's decent, it's if it's uh, not too expensive to reanimate the dead, hmm. Pelagius, he said. He normally would have said Prince Pelagius, but he was told not to draw attention to himself while in town. I used to know someone named Pelagius, the old woman said and slowly smiled. Are you here alone, Pelagius? My father is with the army storming the castle, but he'll be back when the walls have been breached. Which I dare say won't take too much longer, sighed the old woman. Nothing, no matter how well built, tends to last. Are you buying something in the mage's guild? I wanted to buy a gift for my uncle, said Pelagius, but I don't know if I have enough gold. The old woman left the boy to look over the wares while she went to the guild enchanter. He was a young nord, ambitious and new to the kingdom of solitude. It took little persuasion and a lot of gold to convince him to remove the Shan spell from the soul gem and imbue it with a powerful curse, a slow poison that would drain wisdom from its wearer year by year, until he or she lost all reason. So now it would actually be a curse, that full amulet. Train wisdom year by year. She also possesses the sheep ring of fire resistance. Mm. For your kindness to an old woman, I brought you this, she said, giving the boy the necklace and the ring. <sighs> yes, the necklace, great. You can give the ring to your uncle and tell him it has been enchanted with the levitation spell. So if ever he needs to leap from high places, it will protect him. The soul gem is for you. Of course, the soul gem will for be for him so that he will be absolutely trained from wisdom and will be mad and the angle will jump to his try to levitate and will actually have just a fire protection thingy in it. So that's good. And yes, this is clearly how Pelagius actually went mad. This is the story of the King Pelagius who was absolutely freaking mad. 
And yes, so this is why Belkis went mad. Interesting, very much so interesting. Thank you, said the boy. But this, this is too kind of you. Kindness has nothing to do with it, she answered quite honestly. You see, I was in a hall of records at the Imperial Palace once or twice, and I read about you in the foretellings of the Elder Scrolls. You will be the Emperor one day, my boy, the Emperor Belakius Septim III, and with this soul gem to guide you, posterity will always remember you and your deeds. Yes. With those words, the old woman disappeared down an alley behind the mage's guild. Belakius looked after her, but he did not think to search behind a heap of stones. If he had, he would have found a tunnel under the city into the very heart of Castle Solitude. And if he had found this way there, he would have found, past the Champlain undead and the moldering remains of a once grand palace, the bedroom of the Queen. In that bedroom, he would have found the fourth Queen of Solitude in repose listening to the sounds of her castle collapsing, and he would see a toothless grin growing on her face as she breathed her last. From the pen of Isolius second century sage, then to the history part. Potema Septim died after a month-long siege on her castle. While she lived, she had been the full queen of solitude, daughter of the Emperor Belagius II, wife of King Mantiarco, aunt of the Empress Kintira II, mother of Imp Emperor Uriel III, and sister of the Emperor Antiochus and Sephorus. At her death, Magnus appointed his son Belagius as the titular head of solitude under guidance from the royal council. There, there are 140. The Emperor Sephorus Septim died after falling from his horse. His brother was proclaimed the Emperor Magnus Septim. Pelagius, King of Solitus, is recorded as occasionally eccentric in the imperial annals. He married Cataris, Duchess of Fadenfell, at 141. Third era 145. The Emperor Magnus Septim dies. His son, who will be known as Pelagius the Mad, is coronated. Well, I didn't know about this being about the mad king Belagius, but so it was. Well, the story, how he happened to be the one to get the crown and yeah, be the emperor and why he was actually mad. He probably wouldn't have been mad without that. Yes, well, well. That's the whole story. Well, indeed. Well, that was a thing. Yes, yeah, a thing that happened. <sighs> So I guess there's a couple of choices. Do we go and continue still for an hour with Morrowind? Even though, in all reality, we won't be getting that far. As thus, it could be an okay place to also end for the Morrowind part, just for the reason that it's still at least all of the books. Even if nothing else, basically. But all of the books would have read, and um, we could go and see about playing some more as of course, and maybe if we get into a good point there, we can even play some more RimWorld too later on, but I don't know, we'll see. That could be a possibility though, just to keep a two hour stream for this time around, for this reason. Because, well, we could be leaving, I needed to go into here somewhere, explore, try to get the, them to appoint me as the Hortator for the Telvanni Council, but... Hmm. And it was a good read. It's interesting to know why Pelagius the Mad was a thing. Do you recall when you first started with Morrowind? It's been a long time already, Chim Chim, that's for sure. It was already last year, wasn't it? Or was it? I'm not sure, it's been a long time anyways, for sure. It's been a long freaking while since I've been playing Morrowind now. But I'm fine with changing. Hmm. I don't remember what day that would have been. There's been at least like 34 streams, I guess, overall. So if it's been each Friday, then it counts from... And it's not a each Friday because there's been few skip days after all, so... Oh dear, I think I'm 
might have seen that we started in November sometime. So yay, we have been playing Morrowind for about a year soon. <laughs> last year it wasn't it pretty far into last year, like in fall. Yeah, at fall at some point. But I'm just wondering at what point did I actually start doing streams on Fridays and Sundays? Because first it was only one day. I guess during that time I just did the Bioshock 1 for example through. After that did I start doing like Sundays, Bioshock 2 and then Morrowind on Fridays? Question mark. But yeah, November seems reasonable. Okay, let's try to see if we can go and play at least one chapter of uh, Ash of Gods and maybe we can uh, even play a little bit of Rim World after that. We'll see about that, but thank you for watching some Homura Wind and next time we will then again adventure actually, but hey. We got through a very sweet book series, so I'm happy with that. So thank you everyone for watching some more Morrowind and uh, we'll see you with more Morrowind then next Friday, shall we? Ah, okay, thank you for watching. See you next time.